Chapter 3 Tenants In and Out Upstairs, in 3D, Angela Wexler stood on a hassock as still and blank-faced pretty as a store window dummy. Her pale blue eyes stared unblinkingly at the lake. Turn, dear, said Flora Baumbach, the dressmaker who lived and worked in a smaller apartment on the second floor. Angela pivoted in a slow quarter turn. Oh! Startled by the small cry, Flora Baumbach dropped the pin from her pudgy fingers and almost swallowed the three in her mouth. Please be careful, Mrs. Baumbach. My Angela has very delicate skin. Grace Windsor Wexler was supervising the fitting of her daughter's wedding dress from the beige velvet couch. Above her hung the two dozen framed flower prints she had selected and arranged with the greatest of taste and care. She could have been an interior decorator, a good one, too, if it wasn't for the pressing demands of so on and so forth. Mrs. Baumbrack didn't prick me, mother, Angela said unevenly. I was just surprised to see smoke coming from the Westinghouse chimney. Crawling with slow caution on her hands and knees, Flora Baumbach paused in search of the drop pin to peer up through her straight gray bangs. Mrs. Wexler set her coffee cup on the driftwood table and craned her neck for a better view. We must have new neighbors. I'll have to drive up there with a housewarming gift. They may need some decorating advice. Hey, look! There's smoke coming from the Westinghouse! Again, Turtle was late with the news. Oh, it's you. Mrs. Wexler always seems surprised to see her other daughter, so unlike golden-haired, angel-faced Angela. Flora Baumbach, about to rise with the found pin, quickly sank down again to protect her sore shin in the shag carpeting. She had pulled Turtle's braid in the lobby yesterday. Otis Amber says the old man Westing's stinking corpse is rotting on an oriental rug. My, oh my, Flora Baumbach exclaimed, and Mrs. Wexler clicked her tongue in an irritated <coughs> Turtle decided not to go on with the horror story. Not that her mother cared if she got killed or ended up in a raving lunatic. Mrs. Baumbach, could you have my witch's costume? I need it for tonight. Mrs. Wexler answered, Can't you see she's busy with Angela's wedding dress? And why must you wear a silly costume like that? Really, Turtle, I don't know why you insist on making yourself ugly. It's no sillier than a wedding dress, Turtle snapped back. Besides, nobody gets married anymore, and if they do, they don't wear silly wedding dresses. She was close to a tantrum. Besides, who would want to marry that stuck-up, know-it-all, marshmallow-faced Dr. Denton? That is enough of your smart mouth! Mrs. Wexler leapt up, hand ready to strike. Instead, she straightened a framed flower print, patted her fashionable honey-blonde hairdo, and sat down again. She had never hit Turtle, but one of these days, besides a stranger was present. Dr. Deer is a brilliant young man, she explained to Flora Baumbach's ears. The dressmaker smiled politely. Angela will soon be Angela Dear. Isn't that a precious name? The dressmaker nodded. And then we'll have two doctors in the family. Now where do you think you're going? Turtle was at the front door. Downstairs to tell Daddy about the smoke coming from the Westinghouse. Come back this instant. You know your father operates in the afternoon. Why don't you go do your homework and work on the stock market reports or whatever you do in there? Some room. It's even too small for a closet. I'll hem your witch's costume, Turtle, Angela offered. Mrs. Wexler beamed on her perfect child, draped in white. What an angel! Clo Crow's clothes were black, her skin dead white. She looked severe, rigid in fact, rigid and righteously severe. No one could have guessed under that stern facade her stomach was doing flip-flops as Dr. Wexler cut out a corn. Staring down at the fine lines of pink scalp that showed through the podiatrist's thinning light brown hair did nothing to ease her queasiness. 
So, softly humming a hymn, she settled her gaze on the north window. Smoke! Watch it! Jake Wexler almost cut off her little toe along with the corn. Unaware of the near amputation, the cleaning woman stared at the Westinghouse. If you would just sit back, Jake began, but his patient did not hear him. She must have been a handsome woman at one time, but a life had used her harshly. Her faded hair, knotted in a tight bun at the nape of her gaunt neck, glinted gold-red in the light. Her profile was fine, marred only by the jut of her clenched jaw. Well, let's get on with it. Friday was his busy day. He had a phone calls to make. Please sit back, Mrs. Crow. I'm almost finished. What? Jake gently replaced her foot on the chair's pedestal. I see you've hurt your shin. What? For an instant, their eyes met. She looked away, a shy creature, or a guilty one. Crow averted her face when she spoke. Your daughter Turtle kicked me, she muttered, staring once again at the Westinghouse. That's what happens when there's no religion in the home. Sandy says Westing corpse is up there, rotting away on an oriental rug. But I don't believe it. If he's truly dead, then he's roasting in hell. We are sinners, all. What do you mean his corpse is rotting on an oriental rug? Some kind of Persian rug? Maybe a Chinese rug? Mr. Hu joined his son at the glass sidewall of the fifth floor restaurant. And why were you wasting precious time listening to an overage delivery boy with an overactive imagination when you should have been here studying? It was not a question. Doug's father never asked questions. Don't shrug at me. Go study. Sure, Dad. Doug jogged off through the kitchen. It was no use arguing that there was no school tomorrow, just track practice. He jogged down the back stairs. No matter what excuse he gave, go study, his father would say, go study. He jogged into the Who's rear apartment, stretched out on the bare floor, and repeated, go study, to 20 sit-ups. Only two customers were expected for the dinner hour. Shin Hu's restaurant could seat 100. Mr. Hu slammed the reservation book shut, pressed his hand against the pain in his ample stomach, unwrapped a chocolate bar, and devoured it quickly before acid etched another ulcer. Back home again, is he? Well, Westing won't get off so easy this time. Not in his life. A small, delicate woman in a long white apron stood in silence before the restaurant's east window. She stared longingly into the boundless gray distance as if far, far off on the other side of Lake Michigan lay China. Sandy McSuthers saluted as the maroon Mercedes swung around the curved driveway and came to a stop at the entrance. He opened the car door with a ceremony reserved only for Judge J.J. J. Ford. Look up there, Judge. There's smoke coming from the Westinghouse. A tall black woman in a tailored suit, her short clipped hair touched with gray, slipped out from behind the wheel handed the car keys to the doorman, and cast a disinterested glance at the house on the hill. They say nobody's up there, just the corpse of an old man westing rotting away on an oriental rug, Sandy reported as he hoisted a full briefcase from the trunk of the car. Do you believe in ghosts, Judge? There is certain to be more rational explanation. You're right, of course, Judge. Sandy opened the heavy glass door and followed on the judge's heels through the lobby. I was just repeating what Otis Amber said. Otis Amber is a stupid man, if not downright mad. J.J. Ford hurried to the elevator. She should not have said that. Not her. Not the first black, the first woman, to have been elected to a judgeship in the state. She was tired after a trying day. That was it. Or was it? So Sam Westing has come home at last. Well... She could sell the car, take out a bank loan, and pay him back in cash. But what would? He, but would he take it? Please don't repeat what I said about Otis Amber, Mr. McSuthers. Don't worry, Judge. The doorman escorted her to the door of apartment 40. What will you tell me is strictly confidential? And it was. J.J. J. Ford was the biggest tipper in Sunset Towers. I saw some b b b b Chris Theodorakis was too excited to stutter out the news to his brother. 
One arm shot out and twisted up over his head. Dumb arm. Theo squatted next to the wheelchair. Listen, Chris, I'll tell you about the haunted castle on the hill. His voice was soothing and hushed in mystery. Somebody is up there, Chris, but nobody is there. Just rich Mr. Westing, and he's dead. Dead as a squashed June bug and rotting away on a moth-eaten oriental rug. Chris relaxed as he always did when his brother told him a story. Theo was good at making up stories. And the worms are crawling in and out of the dead man's skull, in and out of his ear holes, his nose holes, his mouth holes, in and out of all his holes. Chris laughed, then quickly composed his face. He was supposed to look scared. Theo leaned closer, and high above the putrid corpse, a crystal chandelier is tinkling. It tinkles and twinkles, but not one breath of air stirs in that gloomy tomb of a room. Gloomy tomb of a room. Theo will make a good writer some day, Chris thought. He wouldn't spoil this wonderful, spooky Halloween story by telling him about the real person up there, the one with the limp. So Chris sat quietly, his body at ease, and heard about ghosts and ghouls and purple waves and smiled at his brother with pure delight. A smile that could break your heart, Sadell Pulaski, the tenant in 3C, always said, but no one paid any attention to Sadell Pulaski. Sadell Pulaski struggled out of the taxi, large and first. She was not a heavy woman, just wide-hipped from years of secretarial sitting. If only there was a ladylike way to get out of a cab. Her green rhinestone-studded glasses slipped down her fleshy nose as she grappled with a triangular package and a stuffed shopping bag. If only that lazy driver would lend her a hand. Not for a nickel tip, he wouldn't. The cabbie slammed the back door and sped around the curved driveway, narrowly missing the Mercedes that Sandy McSouthers was driving to the parking lot. At least the never-there-when-you-need-him doorman had propped open the front door. Not that he ever helped her, or noticed her for that matter. No one ever noticed. Sadell Pulaski limped through the lobby. She could be carrying a high-powered rifle in that package and no one would notice. She had moved to Sunset Towers hoping to meet elegant people, but no one had invited her in for so much as a cup of tea. No one paid her any attention to her, except that poor crippled boy who would smile could break your heart, and the bratty kid with the braid. She'll be sorry she kicked her in the shin. Juggling her load, earrings jingling and charm bracelet jangling, Sadell Pulaski unlocked the several locks to apartment 3C and bolted the door behind her. There'd be fewer burglaries around here if people listened to her about putting a deadbolt locks. But nobody listened. Nobody cared. On the plastic-covered dining table, she set out the contents of the shopping bag. Six cans of enamel, paint thinner, and brushes. She unwrapped the long packages and leaned four wooden crutches against the wall. The sun was setting over the parking lot, but Sadell Pulaski did not look out her back window. From the side window smoke... From the side window, smoke could be seen rising from the Westing house, but Sadell Pulaski did not notice. No one ever notices Sadell Pulaski, she muttered, but now they will. Now they will. Chapter 4 The Corpse Found The Halloween moon was full. Except for her receding chin, Turtle Wexler looked very inch the witch. Her dark, unbraided hair streaming wild in the wind from under her peaked hat, a putty wart pasted on the small, on her small beaked nose. If only she could fly to the Westinghouse on a broomstick instead of scrambling over the rocks on all fours, what with all she had to carry. Under the long black cape, the pockets of her jeans bulged with necessities for the night's dangerous vigil. Doug Hu had already reached the top of the cliff and taken his station behind the maple on the lawn. The track star was chosen timekeeper because he could run faster than anyone in the state of Wisconsin. Here she comes. It's about time. Shivering knee-deep in damp leaves that couldn't do his leg muscles much good, he readied his thumb on the button of the stopwatch. Turtle squinted into the blackness that lay within the open French doors open as though someone or something was expecting her there's no such thing as a ghost besides all you had to do was speak friendly like to them ghosts like dogs 
know when a person's scared. Ghosts or worse, Otis Amber had said. Well, not even the worse could hurt Turtle Wexler. She was pure of heart indeed. She only kicked shins in self-defense. So that couldn't count against her. She wasn't scared. She was not scared. Hurry up! That was Doug from behind the tree. At $2 a minute, 25 minutes would pay for the subscription to the Wall Street Journal. She could stay all night. She was prepared. Turtle checked her pockets. Two sandwiches. Sandy's flask filled with orange pop. A flashlight. Her mother's silver cross to ward off vampires. The, porty, the putty wart on her nose soaked in Angela's perfume in the event that she was locked up with the stinking corpse was clogging her nostrils with sticky sweetness. Turtle took a deep breath of chill night air and flinched with pain. She was afraid of dentists, not ghosts, or don't think about purple waves. Think about two dollars a minute. Now one, two, three, three and a half. Go! Doug checked his stopwatch. Nine minutes. Ten minutes. Eleven minutes. Suddenly, a terrified scream. A young girl's scream pierced the night. Should he go in? Or was this one of the brat's tricks? Another scream closer. Yee! Clutching the bunched cape around her waist, Turtle came hurtling out of the Westinghouse. Turtle had seen the corpse in the Westinghouse, but it was not rotting and it was not sprawled on an oriental rug. The dead man was tucked in a four-poster bed. A throbbing whisper, purple, purple, or was it turtle, turtle, whatever it was, it was scary, had beckoned her to the master bedroom on the second floor and maybe it was a dream. No, it couldn't be. She ached all over from the tumble down the stairs. The moon was down, the window dark. Turtle lay in the narrow bed in her narrow room, waiting. Dark, still dark, waiting. At last, slow morning crept up the cliff and raised the Westinghouse, the house of whispers, the house of death. Two dollars times twelve minutes equals twenty-four dollars. Thud. The morning newspaper was flung against the front door. Turtle tiptoed through the sleeping apartment to retrieve it and climbed back into bed, the dead man staring at her from the front page. The face was younger, the beard, the short beard, darker, but it was he, all right. Sam Westing, found dead. Found? No one else knew about the bedded-down corpse except Doug, and he had not believed her. Then, who found the body? The Whisperer? Samuel W. Westing, the mysterious industrialist who disappeared thirteen years ago, was found dead in his Westingtown mansion last night. He was sixty-five years old. The only child of immigrant parents orphaned at the age of twelve, self-educated, hard-working, Samuel Westing saved his laborer's wages and bought a small paper mill. From these meager beginnings, he built the giant Westing Paper Products Corporation and founded the city of Westingtown. To his house, his thousands of workers and their families. His estate is estimated to be worth over two hundred million dollars. Turtle read that again. Two hundred million dollars? Wow! When asked the secret of his success, the industrialist always replied, Clean living, hard work, and fair play. Westing set his own example. He neither drank nor smoked and never gambled. Yet he was a dedicated gamesman and a master at chess. Turtle had been in the game room. That's where she picked up the billiard cue she had carried upstairs as a weapon. A great patriot, Samuel Westing, was famous for his fun-filled Fourth of July celebrations. Whether disguised as Ben Franklin or a lowly drummer boy, he always acted a role in the elaborately staged pageants which he wrote and directed. Perhaps best remembered was his surprise portrayal of Betsy Ross. Games and feasting followed the pageant 
and at sunset Mr. Westing put on his Uncle Sam costume and set off fireworks from his front lawn. The spectacular pyrotechnic display could be viewed 30 miles away. Fireworks! So that's what was in those boxes stamped Danger Explosives stacked in the ground of the floor storeroom. What a pyro- what's a pyrotechnic display that would make if they all went off at the same time? The Paper King's later years were marred by the tragedy. His only daughter, Violet, drowned on the eve of her wedding, and two years later his troubled wife deserted their home. Although Mr. Westing obtained a divorce, he never remarried. Five years later, he was sued by an inventor over the rights to disposable paper insult diaper. On his way to court, Samuel Westing and his friend, Dr. Sidney Sykes, were involved in a near-fatal automobile accident. Both men were hospitalized with severe injuries. Sykes resumed his Westingtown medical practice and the post of the country coroner, but Westing disappeared from sight. It was rumored, but never confirmed, that he controlled the vast Westing Paper Products Corporation from a private island in the South Seas. He is still listed as chairman of the board. We are surprised as you are and deeply saddened, a spokesman for Julian R. Eastman, president and chief executive officer of the corporation, stated when informed that Westing's body was found in his lakeside home. Dr. Sykes's response was, A tragic end to a tragic life. Sam Westing was a truly great and important man. The funeral will be private. The executor of the Westing estate said that the deceased requested that in place of flowers, donations be sent to blind bowlers of America. Turtle turned the page of the newspaper, but that was all. That was all? There was no mention of how the body was found. There was no mention of the envelope propped on the bedside table on which a shaky hand had scrawled, If I am found dead in bed. She had been edging her way against the four-poster, reading the words in the beam of the flashlight when she felt the hand, the waxy dead hand that lay on the red, white, and blue quilt. Through her scream she had seen the white-bearded face. She remembered running, tripping over the billiard cue, falling down the stairs, denting Sandy's flask, and dropping everything else. There was no mention of two suspicious peanut butter and jelly sandwiches on the premises, or a flashlight, or a silver cross on a chain. There was no mention of prowlers, no mention of anyone having seen a witch, not to mention of footprints on the lawn, track shoes, and sneakers size six. Oh well, she had nothing to fear other than losing her mother's cross. Old Mr. Westing probably died of a heart attack, or pneumonia. It was drafty in there. Turtle hid the folded newspaper in her desk drawer and counted her black and blue marks, seven, dressed and set out to find the four people who knew she had been in the Westing house last night. Doug Who, Theo Theodorakis, Otis Amber, and Sandy. They owed her $24. At noon, the 62-year-old delivery boy began his rounds. He had 16 letters to deliver from E.J. Plum, attorney at law. Otis Amber knew what the letters said because one was addressed to him. As a named beneficiary in the estate of Samuel W. Westing, your attendance is requested in the South Library of the Westing House tomorrow at 4 p.m. for the reading of the will. Means old man Westing left you some money, he explained. Just sign this receipt here. What do you mean? What does position mean? It means position, like a job. Most receipts have that to make sure the right person gets the right letter. Grace Windsor Wexler wrote housewife, crossed it out, wrote decorator, crossed it out, and wrote heiress. Then she wanted to know, who else? How many? How much? I ain't allowed to say nothing. The other heirs were too stunned by the unexpected legacy to bother him with questions. Madam Who marked an X, and her husband filled in her name and position. Theo wanted to sign the receipt for his brother, but Chris insisted on doing it himself. Slowly, taking great pains, he wrote Christos Theodorakis, Bird Watcher. By the time the sun had set behind Sunset Tower's parking lot, 
Otis Amber, Deliverer, had completed his rounds. <laughs>